everyone, we are in Belgium finally. It's time for the DTM, the sun is shining, and we are back in Zolder after 17 years. It all started here in 1984, and then since 2002, we haven't been back, and now we're really excited. And the man who's starting in Poland is Marco Wittmann, so I bet you're really excited too. Um, tell me the character of the Zolder circuit. How fantastic is it for you to be racing here? Yeah, it's definitely great fun. You know, it's quite challenging, especially sector two, sector three where it's very narrow, uh, slow speed corners, chicanes. It's quite tricky, I have to say. Um, also a bit tricky to overtake. That will be interesting in the race. But yeah, I mean, starting from Paul is definitely a good start. So you have a good feeling for uh, winning this race here in Zolder? Yeah, that would be great, definitely. I mean, first of all, we need to, to get a good start on the race and then we see. But um, yeah, as I said, starting from front row is always great. Absolutely. So best of luck, Marco. Thank you so much. And now to the commentator. Thank you so much, Verena. Well, Marco certainly did nail it in qualifying. Mega Marco put the car pole position, of course, to uh, back up the fact that he won race one at Hockenheim in the opening round. The chairman of the DTM, Mr. Gerhard Berger, then taking a look at Mike Rockefeller's car. Now, that is not his qualifying position. Mike Rockefeller will be starting from the back of the pack. Why? He had a problem with his uh, clutch, and uh, they were working on it, as you can see. And having to work on the car in Perk Ferme conditions means that you go to the back of the grid. So risk versus reward. They had to work on the car. Uh, it means that he starts from the back of the grid. It also means that there is the uh, potential there for the Audi Sport Team Phoenix to roll a strategy that perhaps they wouldn't with uh, Mike Rockefeller because he'll be going right from the back of the grid. Let's see how it plays out. Weather conditions absolutely lovely at the moment and uh, we're expecting it to stay this way today, not expecting the weather to be quite as good tomorrow and therefore that may play into the strategic use of the tyre allowance that is made to the DTM drivers. This is Ferdinand Habsburg, saw him just a few moments ago as I was making my way into the TV compound doing his warm-up exercises. Another one that will have done them, ready for the race, is of course the Audi driver Robin Freins, who we hear from now. And I'm here with a Dutchman with Robin Freins. You're actually Dutch, but you uh, live just half an hour away from Zolder, so that's very convenient. And you were in a chocolate manufactory uh, really nearby in Belgium. And so my question now, of course, is do you have a sweet tooth? Unfortunately, I do. Uh, I adore chocolate, so if there's on the dessert a chocolate lava cake, it's very hard for me to say no about it. <laughs> I know the feeling. Now, today you're starting in P5, so what's your feeling for this race and how fantastic is it actually being back here in Zolder? It's good that, uh, I mean, DTM has been a very long way uh, coming to back to Zolder and uh, it's good to see a lot of people here. Uh, it's, a, it's a great event for, for, the, for the track. Uh, starting P5, obviously, it's not so easy to overtake on the track, it's very fun to drive. So, a good start is crucial and hopefully we can battle with the uh, front runners. I'm sure you're going to push really hard. So best of luck, Robin. Thank you so much. Back to the commentator. Thank you so much. Great to see Robin and Rene turning their hands at becoming chocolatiers rather than brilliant racing drivers, which, of course, they both are. And there we can see Loic Duval in the final stages of uh, preparation as he uh, uh, puts his... Uh, Protective uh, material on Lloyd Duval, and there to the left-hand side of your picture is one Mr. Jake Dennis. So uh, Jake then um, for the Aston Martin R Motorsport team, his qualifying time a 122.215 gives him a P13 start. So uh, Jake Dennis, there his car looks absolutely brilliant in my opinion. The Aston Martin Vantage DTM car looks. An absolute piece, and I have to say, I love the grey colour. It's kind of almost like primer, isn't it? But uh, and Jake Dennis certainly knows how to propel that car. Uh, there is the number 27 car of Jonathan Aberdeen. Lots of uh, talking about Jonathan Aberdeen at Hockenheim. Will we be doing the same today here at Zolder? Well, time will tell because the race time is uh, coming up not far away now. And now I'm here with a living legend with Harald Groß because back then when it started here, the whole history of DTM, a man who wrote history, is indeed Harald because Harald, in 1984, the very first race, you actually won. Do you remember what it was like back then? Yeah, I can mich sehr, sehr gut erinnern. We waren mit rund 30 Autos am Start and es waren knallharte Zweikämpfe mit Hans Stuck. Und zwei Runden vor Schluss hatte ich das glücklichere Ende. Jeder von uns konnte gewinnen. Und durch die extremen Zweikämpfe mit dem BMW 635 
hat er dann vorne links ein äh, Rad verloren und ich habe dann war der glücklich und habe dann gewonnen. Aber das ganze Rennen war extrem vom Kontaktracing äh, bestätigt, war, war toll, war einfach toll, ja. So obviously Harald does remember very well, because back then, uh, when he won the very first race, it was very close with uh, Hans Stuck, and he was very lucky to win in the end, and Hans Stuck lost a wheel, so it was his fortune that uh, he won in the end. It was a lot of contact back then. Um, and you're also actually uh, doing the Touring Car Classic here in Solda, and the qualifying already took place, and I think in your class you were number one, right? Yeah, auch wieder Nummer eins, wieder Pole Position. Insgesamt Dritter, aber in meiner Klasse vorne und ich bin sehr, sehr glücklich, weil ich habe hier insgesamt siebenmal gewonnen und eigentlich war Zolda auch mein Wohnzimmer. So Zolda really is his favorite racetrack. All in all, he won here seven times. So let's cross our fingers that Harald is going to win in the Touring Car Classics race as well today. We're crossing our fingers, but now let's have a look at DTM and here's your commentator. Thank, Thank you, Harald. Verena, I am so glad that you translated that because I had real fears that I was going to have to try and uh, tell you what Harold was saying. And I'm not brilliant at uh, German uh, uh, language conversion, it has to be said. Harold Groves then, the first winner here uh, when DTM was here in uh, Zolder. And of course, uh, pole position then taking part in those historic classics today as we look at uh, Philipp Eng. Now, just a few moments ago, I was extolling the virtues of driver number 76, Jake Dennis. Let's hear from him. So I'm here with Jake Dennis. You're the fastest Aston Martin out in the field, starting in P13. The sun is shining. Uh, we're at Zolder. So how excited are you, are you about that? But how tough, honestly, is this race going to be, do you think? Yeah, it's going to be super tough. Obviously, qualifying went well for us. Uh, we ended up a lot closer than what we thought we would be. To finish top Aston's great, but uh, only gave me one position. <laughs> But uh, to my teammates, but yeah, I'm super excited for the race. It's going to be really challenging for the drivers. The tire deck is massive, uh, as we've seen in the testing in FP1, FP2. So that's going to be super challenging. Of like, if you pit too early, then you're going to be too slow at the end, and if you stop too late, then you get massively undercut. So it's going to be different strategies you'll see throughout the race for sure. Hopefully, we pick the right one. Uh, we need a bit of luck to get into the points, but yeah, I'll be pushing uh, flat out. Well, I'm crossing my fingers. Thank you very much. Best of luck and back to you. Well, Jake Dennis tells us a story there. He says the tire deck is absolutely massive. Now, of course, put this in mind. It's mandatory for the DTM drivers to make one stop. Doesn't mean they only have to make one stop. Just bear that in mind. Sheldon van der Linde then in uh, car number 31, rookie into his first season of the DTM. What a good qualifying he had. He's going from P4 on the grid. And bear in mind, he backs that up or backs his performance up from Hockenheim with that qualifying position. He took a P6 and a P14 at Hockenheim. Very good debut indeed. Former champion Bruno Spengler drives the BMW Bank BMW M4 DTM, uh, driver number seven. He put the car P3, so good quality from uh, Bruno Spengler into the top three in terms of uh, qualifying. Do bear in mind it was super tight in qualifying with uh, the top eight places uh, merely tenths apart. And from our helicopter shot, you can see how this uh, four kilometer circuit unwinds through the trees here. Uh, some 10 turns, four of them left, six of them right. However, turn seven is a right, left, right, right, actually. Um, but there, it just unwinds. It's an extraordinary place where you can get really, really close to the action. So as a race fan, it's a great place to be. Rennie Rast then, a 121.349, was enough to give him P2 on the grid. So bearing in mind that Rennie Rast comes here with a rich vein of confidence, if you like, having taken the uh, race win in uh, Hockenheim in uh, race two. So uh, Rennie Rast then should be and uh, feeling good. And his qualifying would suggest that that is the case. And Marco Wittmann, you can never discount the man. He won race one, of course, at Hockenheim, a two-time DTM champion, and he's put the car on pole position. As we heard from him earlier on, it's going to be challenging. It's going to be tricky, uh, but he has put himself in the best possible place to take advantage of uh, running right at the front of the pack, certainly at the start of the race. So uh, Marco Wittmann and the uh, RMG team will be working hard to make sure that he he maintains that P1 position. Marco Wittmann then, two-time DTM champion and going from pole position as the DTM returns to Zolder then. Following our last appearance here, we're back in Belgium and there is the circuit. Bathed in sunshine for this afternoon, we're looking forward to the race.
Welcome to Zolder, just 77 kilometers from Brussels. 22 DTM races since 1984. An extraordinary area, very green, very lush, and some wonderful architecture, as you can see. And we have been welcomed back into Belgium with open arms, it has to be said. And this is the circuit as it unwinds. And of course, the venue, extraordinarily, for the DTM opening round back in 1984. A good crowd have flocked to uh, Zolder to enjoy day one of the two-day race weekend here. And Marco Vettman goes from P1 on the grid. Pole position for Marco Vettman. And as we understand it, the track will be hard on tyres. The temperature and ambient temperature will also play their part in terms of the tyre wear. Now, it is mandatory in the DTM for you to make one pit stop. It's not necessarily the only pit stop that you will see as we think that uh, some various uh, cunning strategies will be used during the course of the race today. Maybe we'll see two stops where uh, drivers off. Now, the weather conditions are lovely today. Tomorrow, it's supposed to be altogether different. Now, bearing in mind the tyre allocation that a DTM driver and teams have over the course of the weekend, if it were to be wet tomorrow, therefore you could uh, gamble and use, you know, a greater proportion of slick weather tyres today, thinking that, do you know what, we're not going to need them on Sunday. Therefore, we can get fresh rubber on. However, that is uh, playing into the hands of the uh, weather gods, of course, and hoping that it is going to rain. Let's take a look at the grid then for this race. Going from pole position, Marco Wittmann, P1, Rene Rast, P2. The second row of the grid sees Bruno Spengler, P3, and Sheldon van der Linde, P4, that BMW lockout on row two. Local boy Robin Frines goes from P5 with Timo Glock alongside him. Going to be a danger man from P6. Philip Eng and Nico Muller, P7 and P8, before we see Joel Eriksson and Jamie Green on the fifth row of the grid. To the sixth row, we find Pietro Fittipaldi and Jonathan Aberdeen. Occupying that uh, sixth row, P11 and P12. Jake Dennis and Lloyd Duval, P13 and P14. Jake Dennis, the best of the R Motorsport, Aston Martins, ahead of two of his teammates, Danny Junkadea and Paul Duresta. Then it's Ferdinand Habsburg and Mike Rockefeller pushed to the back of the grid for working on the car during the park Ferme conditions after qualifying. A thumbs up then from Rene Rast, already a race winner this year, chased Gary Paffett all the way to the championship last year. Is this going to be Rene Rast's year? Will it be another year for Marco Wittmann? We're still, of course, in the early stages of the season and a lot of racing to come. There you can see unfold on the left-hand side of the screen this Zolder circuit. Every driver has said it's a tight, challenging one. Alongside me is uh, Brian Oliver. Uh, been uh, some time before I've been able to bring you into this broadcast. Welcome, Brian. Welcome to Zolder. Every driver has talked about how challenging this track is going to be. There's a lot for them to cope with. Tire deck, high curbs in places. A very dry and quite warm track now as well. So we're expecting the strategies perhaps to be muddled up, aren't we? Yeah, good afternoon, Dave. Uh, it could be all about strategy. When we were watching the qualifying this morning, we were expecting the lap times to increase as the ambient temperature went up and as the track rubbered in. And yet the, uh, the lap times were not coming down. The times were not getting faster. And that has pointed the finger towards uh, strategy in this race, hasn't it? Uh, it could be about tyres. Uh, there are so many factors, and as you say, high kerbs, a track that the drivers don't know, and a temperature at the moment that I believe is higher than at any other point during the preparations for this weekend. You're absolutely right. The ambient temperature we have and the track temperature we have uh, across the practice sessions and the qualities, it's the highest it's been. Um, we saw at Hockenheim uh, with the DTM and a number of changes to DTM in... Uh, 2019 and one of the changes is uh, launch control uh, having been uh, outlawed and uh, us not having a launch control well uh, this uh, proved to be something of a problem in terms of wheel spin for a number of the drivers at the start of the uh, race in Hockenheim so uh, we now have a, a kind of a, a launch control light where uh, the drivers uh, can uh, use launch control and uh, that limits the wheel spin if you like up to uh, about 25 kilometers per hour 
So we'll see how they are able to use that at the start of this race, which is literally only minutes away now as the cars are off on their installation lap. There's Marco Wittmann, Renny Rast, Bruno Spengler, Sheldon van der Linde, Robin Freins, Timo Glock. Then we see the number 25 car of Philip Eng. Then it's Nico Muller, Joel Eriksson. Then Jamie Green in the number 53 car. 21 is, of course, uh, driven by Pietro Fittipaldi as all the cars come running through now and the uh, grid graphics at the bottom of the screen to remind you of who's going from where. And Mike Rockefeller with the most work to do right from the back of the grid. Does Robin Freins have any advantage here by being a local boy? Uh, goes from P5 on the grid. We will see as the race unfolds. So 10 turns await them, four left, six right-handers. Track was built back in 1963. And as you can see, it's uh, one that is considered very much an old school circuit. It's a wonderful heli shot then, as the cars uh, make their way up towards uh, uh, turn number seven now, which is that uh, kind of uh, triple apex turn seven. And there the cars go through and will then head down and uh, veering to the right-hand side, uh, towards uh, turn number eight as we pick them up now on their way to uh, turn number eight. So really good to uh, have these heli shots here. And there you can see how close they get to the roads. Turn number eight is almost a hairpin. Uh, and then heading up towards the uh, small uh, Jochen Rint uh, chicane before uh, into uh, turn number 10. Stefan Reinheld then in the center of your picture there for uh, BMW as you can see. All the teams are preparing as well, and the anxiety might be great for a driver in terms of uh, being inside the car, but it's just as great for the teams also who share in the pressure and the stress right at the start of the race. So the cars need to be lined up millimetrically perfectly into their grid boxes. And Marco Vettman, let's hear him being guided into his pit box now. Five, four, three, two, one. Come, 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 come. Come, more, one meter. More, 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 more. More, 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 more. Stop, perfect. So it took a while before they could get Marco Wittmann to where they wanted him to be. They await the uh, rest of the pack to line up into their grid boxes. The last of those is going to be Mike Rockefeller, of course, going from the very back of the grid, having been put back there for his car, being worked on in Park Ferme conditions. And then we will be on 55 minutes plus Outside one lap. Position. Good luck. And we get the green flag from the marshal at the rear. Stand by. We are about to go not only racing, but DTM racing. Live from Zolder, the lights at the top of the screen for you. When five lights are extinguished, Let's go, we were held for a long time. Good start from Rennie Rast, good start too from Bruno Spengler. Not sure Marco Wittmann got the start he wanted. He's gonna lose two places right at the start. Sheldon van der Linde looking very lively as well, but Bruno Spengler leads. Marco Wittmann fighting over that P2 place with Rennie Rast. Side by side as they go through the first sequence of turns here at Zolder. Bruno Spengler in the BMW bank car has put himself in front. A brilliant start from Spengler. Less of a good start from Marco Wittmann. He's uh, managed to get it back into P2, but being chased hard by Rene Rast. So on this opening lap, then, we pick the heli shot up then as uh, Bruno Spengler and Marco Wittmann and the rest of the pack all then make their way through that chicane. And uh, Bruno Spengler just nailed it absolutely perfectly. So the order is Spengler from Wittmann, then it's Rast, then it is Sheldon van der Linde. Good start from Sheldon van der Linde, putting himself past uh, Robin Freins, and Robin Freins losing out as uh, well to another. Joel Eriksson, you can see there in the uh, BMW further back down the pack. Philip Eng with a good start as well. So through this uh, almost light chicane, the Jochen Rint chicane. And uh, the first lap is about to be put in the book then, and Bruno Spengler is leading the race from Marco Wittmann, P2. And they're a problem for the Paul de Resta car. Paul de Resta is into the uh, pit lane. We can only assume that it is a problem for the Paul de Resta car. Speed limiter is on. Push to pass has been enabled for the rest of the uh, cars that are out on track, but Paul de Resta is into the pit lane already. So Spengler leading from Wittmann, from Rast, as they begin to stretch their legs a little bit now. Brian, did you see anything wrong with the de Resta car? 
nothing at all. Um, Early stop, You would perhaps. wonder whether it is a strategic stop. I don't see how it could be, but particularly with tyre degradation this weekend, but it looks like it was just a stop for tyres. Well, I find that extraordinary so early on, but uh, who knows whether this strategy may pay off. Let's see, as uh, Paul DeResta is released from that uh, pit stop, I really rather assumed that there was a problem with the car because mm. I wouldn't have thought that you would stop on the uh, opening lap, but uh, clearly they've uh, done the mathematics, haven't they? And they've looked at the strategic call and have decided that's the best bet for them. So uh, Paul DeResta has been in the pit lane. Of course, that will mean he's plumb last now, but who knows how the race will develop and how it will unfold. So the order then, Spengler, Wittmann, Rast, then it's uh, van der Linde, Philipp Eng, P5, Timo Glock, P6, Robin Fryens, P7, then it's Nico Muller, Jamie Green, and Joel Eriksson rounding out the top 10. So it's a big train of cars then that's being led by Bruno Spengler, the BMW driver. There is the local boy, Robin Fryens then, who is uh, running in P6. And uh, some adjustments being made now to uh, the Mike Rockefeller breaking bias, and Robin Fryan's going quickest through uh, sector one. Okay, Mike, we are ready. Here comes Rocky, another one okay, from. Okay, was it okay to come in or? Perfect. Okay, so Audi Sport Team Phoenix now running it's a all strategy about tire management. call here. Tire management, we can hear that. Also in is Ferdinand Habsburg. We'll fight with the rest on the pit exit. And of course, uh, they will come up against Paul DeResta, who was in on the uh, opening well, lap. Is coming from the back. Let's go. So Mike Rockefeller back out again, then starting from the back of the pack. They've decided that strategic call to bring him in early on. Ferdinand Habsburg has done the same. So already we have seen three drivers into the pit lane. And just for now, Marco Wittmann is beginning to put the pressure on to uh, uh, Bruno Spengler. Uh, but René Rast is going quick through, uh, went quick last time around through sector one. So the Audi driver that is currently running in uh, P3, chasing down uh, Bruno Spengler and Marco Wittmann. Robin Freins is under investigation potentially for a jump start. So Robin Freins then, who's currently running in uh, P6. So you can see both Mike Rockefeller and Ferdinand Habsburg stopped on lap two. Paul DeResta stopped on lap one. And there is uh, Mike Rockefeller back out on track once again, ahead of uh, Paul DeResta. And Robin Fryens has got a pit stop penalty. He's going to have to add five seconds to his uh, mandatory pit stop for jumping the start. So I didn't see Robin get away that well. But clearly he did. Race control, of course, have got uh, even more cameras and even more sensors than we have. And therefore, every decision they make is uh, based upon uh, the facts that they have at their disposal. And I have to say, Brian, it's not uh, something that I would want to be in terms of uh, decisions that are made, but race stewarding. And also under investigation for another potential jump start is Pietro Fittipaldi. I'm tempted to say this is the drivers getting used to the new sort of launch light control that they have. That's exactly what I was going to say, because uh, they had a completely different system in Hockenheim a, a few weeks ago. No system. And, and, well, no system <laughs> at all. It did a different way of doing things. And uh, they've had to get used to this uh, this new uh, start light, as we want to call it. And uh, Forgive me interrupting, but Fittipaldi does get the, yeah. another five second, uh, not another, but he gets a five second penalty. So He's the second driver then to have been penalised for jump start. Apologies. No, that, and it's fair to say though that the drivers have not had a chance to acclimatise to this new system. We saw them doing some practice uh, starts uh, in free practice yesterday, but that's about all they've had, I think. That's, and of course, that's that's you know every weekend that we race DTM, we do practice starts because it is so critical and so important to get it right. But I think you're right. It's familiarity, isn't it? You know, it's the first time of using that light system, and uh, well. Uh, as you can see, for a couple of the drivers, it has, uh, it has hurt them. Robin Freins and uh, Pietro Fittipaldi being uh, penalised. So, uh, so we watch from the heli shot there. You can see the uh, Sheldon van der Linde car. Uh, the uh, Castrol Edge uh, BMW. Bruno Spengler leading by just five tenths over Marco Wittmann, who is P2. Then it is René Raston. Look at the braking, how much closer Robin Freins get going through, gets going through that chicane. So Spengler, Wittmann, Raston. Here's a replay of the start then. Let's see if we can see this jump. <sighs> it's not something I would want to call. <laughs> oh, tell you what, Lloyd Tuval was involved in some real panel rubbing right at the start from Danny Jun with Danny Junkadea. Watch this, look, as he dives to the inside there. Two trying to go through that gap right at the front. 
and uh, indeed they did, and both managed to make it through, but uh, there we are. I don't think that uh, really uh, let us uh, see the jump starts any more than, you know, you would need to have all the sensors and all the factors, of course, that uh, uh, they have available to them in uh, race control. So, Philip Eng then, under some pressure from Robin Prines. Now, Philip Eng was brutally quick during one of the free practice sessions and really thought we were going to see great things from Philip Eng this weekend and still we might he's uh, currently running in that p5 position chasing down sheldon van der linde and uh, robin freins uh, right behind him so there is the philip Encar, the number 25 uh, philip Encar, taken some pole positions but he's yet to take his uh, maiden dtm win could this weekend be the weekend that uh, philip Eng does it so the gap between himself and uh, robin freins then seesawing a bit as you can see but only a tenth in it uh, from three tenths to two tenths to three tenths so Nico Muller trying to get onto the back of uh, Robin Freins uh, as well. Bear in mind the cars have got uh, DRS to use and they also have a uh, push-to-pass facility as well. But on a track like this where both DRS and push-to-pass can be used in terms of defence as well as attack, it almost negates the uh, potential advantage that uh, they have. All of a sudden, they're all getting much closer to Spengler and uh, Wittmann. Uh, Spengler, to be fair, has just opened up a little bit more of a margin on uh, Marco Wittmann. It's extended that to uh, nine tenths, and the next under investigation for a potential jump start is Loic Duval. So, car number 28, then the uh, Audi Sport Team Phoenix driver who took a P5 at Hockenheim in uh, race one, maybe under investigation for that jump start. And given that two drivers have already been penalised, I would think that uh, it won't be long before we see that five second uh, pit stop penalty come as Robin Freins takes a look at the inside of Philip Eng. Brave, bold, and determined move there. And even if he thought the overtake is not on, what it's going to do, it will worry Philip Eng ahead of him. And Jamie Green taking a look at the uh, BMW of uh, Timo Glock ahead of him. We go on board with Timo Glock. First, looking back towards the Jamie Green car, now looking forward through the uh, windscreen. As uh, Timo Glock, who's uh, defending that P8 place at the moment, Jamie Green is P9. Then it is uh, Joel Eriksson that's running in uh, P10 currently. So that's the way it looks. Spengler has now extended by another tenth. So he's stretching his legs at the front now. He's up to a full second ahead of Marco Wittmann, Rennie Rast, and Sheldon van der Linde. But they are all concertinaing closer together. So we have a real race on our hands here. And sure enough, as I predicted, Loic Duval does get that five second pit stop penalty. What that means is basically, when he comes in for his mandatory pit stop, he will have to be in the pit lane for five seconds longer. And that is the penalty that he gets. Replay of the start from Marco Wittmann then, who did bog down a little bit, and that allowed Bruno Spengler to go through. And uh, that's where Bruno Spengler picked up the lead of the race. And Rennie Rast also taking advantage as well, but Bruno Spengler taking a dive through the middle. So great to have these uh, replays of the start of the race then. And there you can see Dieter Gas to the very left-hand side of your picture, and. Uh, Arno sends them to the very right-hand side of your picture as they watched from the Audi Sport Team Phoenix garage. So, Jamie Green then, continuing to uh, hound and hassle uh, Timo Glock. And there is uh, the driver that's running P3 at the moment, Rennie Rast, at the back of that picture now. You can see they're all beginning to get just a little bit closer. So, Spengler with eight tenths over Rennie Rast. Sorry, eight tenths over Marco Wittmann and then a further eight tenths over René Rast, who we're on board with now, making his way through that chicane. You have to be careful on the curbs. Some of the curbs are higher than others here. And in terms of uh, tire, de tire degradation, they've got enough to think about. But with those high curbs, Brian, the effect of high curbs is that you can do damage to the side wall of the tires, can't you? You can, and we have seen the drivers just taking it a little bit more carefully. And I think, as predicted, overtaking has been difficult at this track, and those high curbs are definitely a factor in that because you go over those, you, you can wipe out the sidewall of a tyre so easily, and uh, they've discovered this in free practice. So, not prepared. It's the risk-reward uh, calculation, isn't it? Spengler then, six tenths now, as Marco Wittmann lights up a little bit more. So Spengler, Wittmann, Rast, then uh, Sheldon van der Linde, uh, Philip Eng, and then uh, Robin Freins ahead of Nico Muller, Timo Glock, and uh, Jamie Green. So there you can see the uh, gap between uh, Marco Wittmann and uh, Bruno Spengler coming down, Rennie Rast, Rast coming in as well, and last. Joel Eriksson is uh, looking like he's going to be coming in. So we're standing by for Joel Eriksson. Here he is then. And let's watch this uh, pit stop unfold as the team go to work on the uh, Joel Eriksson car. 
So the RBM team then, who of course rehearse and practice this pit stop. 6.6 .6 seconds. Pit stop light, watch the white line. So he's come in for his mandatory pit stop. And uh, Joel Eriksson on his way back out again. We've got uh, 42 and three quarter minutes plus one lap of the race remaining. So still plenty of time for strategic moves to have been made or to be made uh, during the course of this race. So the top three then still got a little bit of a gap on Sheldon van der Linde, who's being propelled into that top three almost by the pace from Philip Eng, who's now right on the back of uh, Sheldon van der Linde. And uh, this then in super slow-mo is a big lock-up from Bruno Spengler. He controls it nicely, but what that does, of course, it allows uh, Marco Wittmann to get just a little bit closer because when you see the tyres lock up like that, your grip is compromised and you lose, even if it's only one hundredths or tenths, Brian, you are losing because you're going the wrong way. Yeah, and you also flat spot your tyres, and that's going to create vibrations, that's going to cause handling issues, so it's something they really want to try and avoid doing, and Bruno Spengler, even though that was a, a fairly light lockup, will still feel the effects of that in the car. Answer this, and you may not know the answer to this, did he lock up because tyre deg is already beginning to play an effect on the handling of, of that car, potentially, and where once, because the race evolves for all of these drivers and their cars, every single lap, you know, the behaviour of the car will alter just tinily, won't it? And I just wonder whether the car was a bit lighter then because, or a bit harder then because, mm. uh, the tyre deg is, is beginning to play an effect. I mean, tyre degradation uh, will come into it, but um, when we look at the cars that have pitted already, and they're all uh, circulating one to two seconds slower than the leaders, so it doesn't look as though tyre degradation is an issue in terms of lap time, um, and it, it might just be changing fuel loads, but I, j I think it's possibly the, uh, the pressure of just Wittmann in his uh, rear yeah. view mirror, to be quite honest. Well, of course, rear view mirror being an optimum thing to say on account of the fact cars <laughs> don't have them anymore, <laughs> yes. do they? Because rear view camera. Yeah, when you look inside the uh, when you look inside the car, it looks like they've got a dash mounted uh, 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 mirror. That actually is not the case at all. It's a, a screen that is projecting images from the rear of the car because there's a new t to even further enhance the uh, inherent safety of the. Uh, uh, DTM cars, there's this new firewall at the back of the driver, which uh, means that you cannot have a traditional rear view mirror because all you would see is the firewall. Uh, yeah. Here comes Jamie Copy Green. So we do two stops. Question? It's possible. It's Repeat, possible. Please. Oh, damn it. Final position with Ericsson <laughs> on the outlap. Tell us. <laughs> I was really hoping that we would get from Audi Sport Team Copy. Rosberg. Are we going to do don't two stops? Spin the rear wheels. Um, and there was no confirmation from the team that Jamie's going to do two stops, but it's possible, was all they would say. So Jamie Green then comes in for his uh, mandatory pit stop, and it might be the first of two, potentially. Don't spin the rear wheels, Jamie. That's what the team said. <laughs> I think he did a little. Uh, I won't tell on you. Uh, <laughs> Jamie Green is back out onto the track again. Will that be the first of potentially two stops? We will see. In the meantime, the top four, five, six, almost seven, are uh, very, very close. And you can see Sheldon van der Linde has just been cracking on, hasn't he? And gradually reducing that gap to Rennie Rast. Spengler doing a good job out front. Apart from that relatively light lockup we saw, he's been uh, faultless right at the front of the pack. And uh, we have still just under 40 minutes plus one lap of this race to uh, come. So Bruno Spengler leading from uh, Marco Wittmann. He's leading by six tenths from Marco Wittmann. Then it's Rennie Rast and Sheldon van der Linde. So, with the exception of uh, Rast running in uh, P3, it's a it's a bit of a BMW fest at the moment, isn't it? With Spengler, Wittmann, van der Linde, and then uh, Philip Eng. I think the man who looks to be on the move is Robin Freins. Uh, he's been putting pressure on Philip Eng for lap after lap, and you can see that he is just eager to get past. That car looks quicker, but as we've said several times already, the overtaking is just not that easy around here. No, and you can be quicker, can't you? But actually, if what Robin Freins is probably doing is thinking, do you know what, the only way I'm going to make this work is to um, provoke a small error mm. uh, from uh, Philip Eng so that I can take advantage of that. Unfortunately, Philip, of course, is one of those drivers that the reason he's as successful as he is is because he tends not to make mistakes. But, you know, they've got no nothing else in the armory, have they, uh, to be able to do that? He no. may well, as you say, he may well have the pace advantage over uh, Philip Eng, but can't quite use it. On board with uh, Rennie Rast, then. 
brilliant shot. And there you can see in the cockpit of his car that new uh, rear view screen that we have, which is shaped like a rear view mirror. And in comes uh, Philip Eng. Also coming in is Nico Muller. So this plays into the hands then of Robin Frines, who's able to get himself up the road, of course, because uh, both Philip Eng and Nico Muller. Stop at the Degra Tower, five second penalty at the Degra Tower. Here comes and then we go Duval. for the pit stop. So Lloyd Duval, uh, one of those that's uh, picked up those uh, that penalty. I, I passed the Degra Tower already. I passed it with nobody to wait for me. Now oh. on the right side. Stop, Loic. That's it, five seconds. Gets the go. So Lloyd Duval now can okay, do his Loic, stop. We change to a scrap set of tyres. So a scrap set going on the Lloyd Duval car. Oh, go, 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 go. Nico, of course, held to allow Philip Eng to come through. Here comes Lloyd Duval as they're stacking them up in the uh, pit lane. So Lloyd Duval then, his pit stop longer than anybody Maybe else's. Front of Rocky. By virtue of the fact that he had to take that uh, time penalty onto his pit stop. As you can see, as they make their way out of pit exit, they uh, shortcut uh, turn number one here. There's the Ferdinand Habsburg car. There is our race leader, Bruno Spengler. And uh, now Robin Frines is harrying, of course, uh, Sheldon van der Linde because Philip Eng coming in for his pit stop means that... Oh, as that uh, is the number 23 car of Danny Junkadea. And that looks like... He's not returning from there. It looked really rather terminal. So uh, Danny Junkadea then pulls the car off onto the grass. And I don't think it looked like he was carrying enough momentum to recover from there. Sure enough, not. Look, he's going to be out of the car. So the Aston Martin Vantage DTM car of uh, Danny Junkadea. Uh, so Joel Eriksson is feeling the uh, weight and might of uh, Philip Eng behind him now as Philip Eng has returned from his uh, mandatory pit stop. Of the cars that have stopped, we've seen Jake Dennis, Philip Eng, uh, Nico Muller, Jonathan Aberdeen. As, oh, there's problems for Jake Dennis in the number 76 car and where that car is positioned, that car is going no further. So Jake Dennis on his uh, on the exit of the pit lane, I think that is, isn't it, Brian? It looks like it, and uh, you, I get the feeling this could be a safety car. Uh, both or two of the Aston Martins going in the same lap. What are the chances of that? In comes uh, the Jonathan Aberdeen car. So we think the uh, Jake Dennis car. Let's pick it up on the map here. The Jake Dennis car is on, in the pit white lane. White yeah. cloud, pit exit. exit. It is in the pit exit. Yeah. No, it's in the pit entrance. So that's even before he's got to the uh, exit. And that's looking very hot indeed, isn't it? Need to get him out of there quick, I think. Oh, what a blow for Jake right. Dennis then. Uh, push to pass has been disabled. Here we can see Danny Junker Day out of his car, and sure enough, we do have a safety car that has been deployed now. Not only for the fact that uh, Jake Dennis is stuck somewhere in the pit lane, but uh, Danny Junker Day, as you can see, is stuck uh, on the side of the uh, track there. So Danny Junker Day going no further. Safety car for DTM means, of course, when it comes to the restart, the cars will be side by side with the indie style restart. And all of a sudden, if Bruno thought he was under some pressure from Marco Vettman, the pressure is going to ramp up significantly, isn't it? So the cars then being led around by the safety car. We have uh, oh, we're not 35 minutes plus a lap still to run. We're on board with uh, Renny Rast now. Now, let's get a look here. That's Spengler and uh, Wittmann. Oh, and Rask losing out there, look. Mm. So, Sheldon van der Linde putting himself ahead of Rennie Rask. Glad we picked up that replay. Thanks so much to the guys for doing that. So, Rennie Rask then just takes too much of the curb or is that a fault with the car it looks like there's lots of lights flashing on that car whether there was a whether the jolt just caused something to reset itself uh, Sheldon van der Linde was able to take advantage and put himself up into P3 so that's uh, Danny Junkadea then he can go no further now uh, Jonathan the safety car uh, is going now to the last chicane. Aberdeen had uh, been into the pit lane. Now they um, take the gamble of bringing Mike Rockefeller in under the safety car. Also, Paul DeResta. 
And if we remember, this is the strategy that Rennie Rast used in Hockenheim. Yeah. And uh, this is very interesting, pitting last minute under the safety car. Yes, it is. So the cars will have to uh, catch up with the crocodile that's being led around by the uh, safety car, which will be uh, relatively easy to do. No indication yet when the uh, safety car is uh, coming in. On board with uh, Mike Rockefeller and uh, Paul DeResta. Now, this is critical because pit exit has been closed. Okay, what happened? That went red. Yeah, because the. Can I go? Is it green or what? Mm -hmm. It says pit exit closed. Pit exit is now open. So Paul DeResta was reacting to the red light that changed just as he got there to say that the pit exit was closed. Now they've reopened the pit exit, so Paul DeResta can go now. Now, being under the safety guard, that won't have cost him too much, Brian. No, uh, and I think he stopped in time enough not to pick up some kind of penalty from that because he did, he, he did make a very sudden stop. And you, do you and think he, he would, did it before? To be fair to him, I think he reacted as quickly as he possibly could. Yeah. I reckon the light changed just as Paul got there. Yeah, that's a and difficult I, one for him. I happened to notice on our timing screen that it said pit exit closed. Um, yeah. So uh, that was why he uh, suddenly locked the car up and brought it to a stop. You're absolutely right. He stopped it within metres, didn't he? Uh, and that was the reason behind that. So, and, and then you could hear Paul DeResta on the radio saying, right, you know, is it green? Can I go what? Let's see it in replay. Good. Well, in fairness, the light was red. The light was red. So Paul reacted to that properly. Now, I wonder, he, in fairness, he has crossed the line. He has crossed the line. I mean, he's, he's waited, but if you're playing it by the absolute book, then he would pick up a penalty for that because he crossed the line, even though he did wait beyond the line. Well, let's see. That, that's down to race control, isn't it? Not us, thankfully. He is <laughs> caught, caught up with a crocodile of cars. That's the uh, Danny Yunkadea car being uh, retrieved and removed uh, from the uh, Zolder circuit here, which is a great shame to see uh, Danny Yunkadea out of the race, of course. So the order then before the Indy Star restart, which we will get following the safety car, is Spengler, Wittmann, Rast. Then it is uh, Sheldon van der Linde, uh, Robin Fryens, Timo Glock. Uh, then it's Pietro Fittipaldi, Joel Eriksson, Philip Eng, Nico Muller, Jamie Green, Lloyd Duval, Jonathan Aberdeen, Ferdinand Habsburg, Mike Rockefeller, and then it's uh, Paul De Resta. So uh, on. He is at retirement then. That is where, unfortunately, it went no further for uh, Danny Uncadea, and this is where it went no further for Jake Dennis, sadly. And there you can see Jonathan Aberdeen just passing him on his way into the pit lane. So to the rest of they're going past the safety car. He's just been waved on to join round at the back of the, of the queue. And this brings us to the Indy restart. I have to say, this is something I love uh, about it's, DTM. It's one of the features of DTM, which is absolutely excellent, isn't it? Uh, but, uh, you know, the cars go side by side. It's like starting the race all over again, in my opinion. So Bruno Spengler will be uh, furious, of course, uh, as we're on board with Paul De Resta now, who's putting quali laps in, in terms of <laughs> catching up with <laughs> yes. the crocodile of cars. So Paul De Resta then, who... Um, took the car to a uh, points-paying finish in uh, Hockenheim. So, of those drivers that have made two stops, Paul, uh, Paul De Resta, uh, Ferdinand Habsburg, and uh, Mike Rockenfeller, some cars have not stopped at all yet, including, uh, well, it's the top six, isn't it? Top seven, in fact. Uh, Spengler, Wittmann, Rast, uh, van der Linde, Freins, Glock, and uh, Pietro Fittipaldi. Bear in mind, Pietro Fittipaldi, another one of those drivers that's picked up a five-second time penalty as well, so he'll, has, he'll have to wait at the uh, entry to the pit lane, or it's, uh, certainly just to the right-hand side of the pit lane for five seconds before his uh, car is released. It, it's not only a five-second uh, penalty because it, take, it costs you more than that in terms of time because you have to slow the car down, stop it, and then re-accelerate um, before you can uh, continue your quest to get down the pit lane to your box. And that five seconds <coughs> feels like an eternity oh, when you're it, sat there with the engine running, just waiting. Doesn't it just? So here is uh, Paul DeResta then. 
qualified lap. <laughs> well, you know, he's still got a good half a lap to do to yes. uh, catch up with the rest of the cars. Uh, Paul de Resta is uh, currently making his way through uh, turn number five, whereas the car's, of course, being led, as you can see, down the start finish straight now. So he's got another... Uh, six turns to get around before he's on the back of this crocodile, but there's no word as to when the uh, safety car is uh, coming in. So he's got the time, and uh, here is uh, Paul de Resta now. So we are uh, with the safety car at the moment. Safety car comes in this lap. Now, this is not going to give, well, De Resta will be on a flyer now, won't he? Because he'll be up to speed. But uh, it's quite a late call to bring the safety car in. Um, you know, it's certainly less than a lap's notice, but uh, Paul De Resta will be fine. He will get to the back of the pack. And just take into account, Paul De Resta's tyres will be significantly warmer than those in front of him. Indeed so. Yes, indeed so. He might be doing some overtaking very early on mm. in the uh, restart. Uh, particularly advantaged by the fact that tyres up to temperature and the indie style restart that we see in DTM. Absolutely. So, there, safety car uh, lights are still on. Uh, the indication to the uh, drivers generally is the lights going out, of course. We've lost uh, Jake Dennis and Danny Yucatea, regrettably. But we still have uh, Paul de Resta and Ferdinand Habsburg out there in the Aston Martin, our motorsport cars. And there you can see the uh, number three car uh, catching up with the back of the pack and almost with them now. And he'll have uh, done a very good job in terms of uh, warming the tyres. Mm. So the heli shot then reveals where the cars are on track. And... Uh, Safety car lights go out. The restart grid, as you can see, as the cars go side by side. The last one in the pack is going to be this man who we're on board with now. Paul de Resta is almost going to get a flyer here, isn't he? Because there, the safety car goes in. Bruno Spengler and Marco Vittman then side by side for this Indy restart. The race distance has increased to 55 minutes plus three laps because of the safety car. Now, as the cars cross the line, Paul de Resta has not made it, or has he? Yes. Yeah, he has. I was looking to see where Ferdinand Habsburg was. Well, Bruno Spengler does a good job. Sheldon van der Linde around the outside of uh, Renny Rast uh, slots himself in. So the two Aston Martins together right at the back of the pack, but uh, Bruno Spengler did a very good job, and Renny Rast looking really racy here as well. Uh, sensing the opportunity to uh, try and advance, but Sheldon van der Linde is having none of it. Puts himself on the inside. And uh, Rennie Rast now finds himself looking at the back end of that BMW. Once again, because of course that happened earlier in the race where uh, he got passed by Sheldon van der Linde. Also looking racy is Robin Freins, right on the back of uh, Timo Glock. So it's Spengler from Wittmann. Then it is uh, van der Linde, then it is Rast, Glock, Freins, Eng, Ericsson, Fittipaldi and Jamie Green rounding out the top 10 at the moment from that Indy Star restart. So we run to 55 minutes plus three laps as Nico Muller um, dive to the uh, inside then in the uh, all green Audi. We could see from our heli shot there. So the action always intensifies following uh, that indie style restart as the cars go side by side. Big, big lockup coming there from Loic Duval. Duval actually made contact with the car that he was passing. Again, quite a big clatter as he went past him. Well, uh, Loic Duval is uh, now chasing down the car of Pietro Fittipaldi. So, Spengler. Bittman. And Philip Eng and uh, Robin Freins having a real ding-dong battle here. And uh, Freins, look. And uh, Timo Glock now. So 24 minutes plus three laps uh, remaining. Push to pass has been enabled. So Philip Eng then P7, Robin Freins P6, Bruno Spengler P1. Still leading the race after the uh, restart. Here comes Jamie Green and Nico Muller side by side in the two Audis then. So Nico Muller then going past uh, Jamie Green to pick up that P9 place. There's Joel Eriksson, car number 47, who's uh, running in P8, and now has Nico Muller for company behind him. So the Zolder circuit then, uh, 2.941 miles, 4 kilometres, delivered uh, quite a lot of race action, to be fair, and still a number of drivers that have got to take their uh, mandatory pit stops. 
So, Dr. Florian Kamelga, of course, is head of our motorsport, and Aston Martin, let's hear what he has to say. So I'm now here with Dr. Florian Kamelga. What a big shame, two Aston Martins are out. Do you know what the issue is? Yeah, we, had to, uh, we have to investigate further. It looks like Danny had some issue with the throttle and, and, and Jake had some electronic failure. Um, but as I said, we have to look into the cars when we have him back. The reality is we have to take these things in uh, uh, as, as, uh, as tests. We're lacking test kilometers, we're lacking test time. And that's, uh, that's we, we knew that, that the first couple of races would be cool, could be difficult. And uh, one step after the other. Yeah, we've got two more cars in there, so best of luck. Thank you, and back to you. Uh, thanks very much. Well, you rejoin us as a whole host of cars come into the uh, pit lane, including uh, Robin Freins, who has to stop for five further seconds, of course, for that penalty. So Bruno Spengler, from the lead of the race, is uh, back on his way out. Robin Freins now dives into his pit box, having served his uh, time penalty. There's Sheldon van der Linde, Timo Glock. Uh, the one that uh, didn't stop is Marco Wittmann, and also not stopping was René Rast. You can also see the number 21 Pietro Fittipaldi car come in also. And uh, so the uh, WRT team go to work on the uh, Pietro Fittipaldi car and release him back out into the uh, hot lap of, uh, or hot lane of the uh, pit lane. Uh, so, as we were hearing from Dr. Florian Kamelger, there was a lot going on in the pit lane, Brian. It suddenly got very, very busy, didn't it? And uh, I expect it was when one uh, car jumps, the others follow. And uh, we've only got uh, two cars now that have not had their mandatory pit stop. And when they do, that puts Philip Eng in a very... Well, Philip Eng, as you're talking about him, he's putting himself up alongside uh, Rennie Rast here and uh, goes through. So, Philip Eng... Mm -hmm gets past uh, Rennie Rass, so Philip Eng is into uh, P2 and we'll put the chase on to Marco Wittmann now. Philip Eng, of course, has uh, stopped. He stopped on lap 12, as you can see. So the durability of the tyres will be absolutely critical for Philip Eng in terms of running to the end of the race. We've got 21 minutes plus three laps remaining. Marco Wittmann is leading the race. Here comes the overtake from uh, Philip Eng then. Dive to the inside of Rennie Rast. Good race room was left by both. And uh, it was a, a fairly strong overtake, that's for sure. And here the Indy style restart then as the cars are all jumbled together once again. Look at the lockups as they went into turn number one. So uh, Bruno Spengler doing a fantastic job at that restart. So too Sheldon van der Linde. So Rennie Rast and Sheldon van der Linde having a real ding dong battle here over that P3 place, as you can see from that uh, Indy Star restart uh, replay that we've got there. And uh, Sheldon van der Linde eventually putting himself ahead of the number 33 Audi, who now has a queue of Joel Erickson and Nico Muller and uh, Jamie Green right behind him. So Rennie Rast in the number 33 car, yet to stop. So he's running on tyres that we think are probably reaching the end of their useful life in terms of degradation because he's got cars uh, battling him who have all made stops and therefore are on relatively fresher rubber. And sure enough, with DRS assist, Joel Eriksson is able to go through. Who said you can't overtake it? Uh, Zolder, they were wrong, because you can. Because here comes Nico Muller and Jamie Green. So Rennie Rast all of a sudden, I mean, he didn't defend the uh, two Audi overtakes quite as vigorously as he did the one uh, from um, uh, Joel Eriksson. Uh, we're on board with uh, Rennie Rast now. It would have almost have been pointless in defending because he has such poor tyres, so yeah. he, had, he had nothing to gain from that. Uh, Philip Eng, uh, he's come up from nowhere. He started seventh on the grid, and uh, once Wittmann has uh, had his mandatory pit stop, Philip Eng will become the new leader. Well, I said uh, in pre-show, Philip Eng was blisteringly fast in free practice. One to watch. Well, maybe so. We still have uh, 18 uh, minutes, or just under uh, 19 minutes, actually, plus uh, three laps for this race. It's getting awfully hot in the comms booth here with the excitement, I can tell you. Marco Wittmann is leading the race, but he's being chased down by Philip Eng, and also Joel Eriksson, of course, up to P3. Now, he stopped on lap eight. Philip Eng stopped on P12. Nico Muller stopped on P12. Jamie Green stopped on lap 10, as opposed to P12, <laughs> forgive me. Um, and Rennie Rast, of course, running in P6, who's still not come in. Is he banking on coming in, doing one stop, and then having tires with life, which will take him to the end of the race? And 
have fresher tyres when others haven't and therefore be able to do some overtaking. Yeah, I mean, he's doing what is almost the opposite to what he did at the last round, isn't he? Because he was the one who came in with the tyre strategy in Hockenheim and here he is dragging it out to the end. And uh, he's, I think he's going to look for a late pit stop and then he is going to be lightning fast. It will be really interesting to see what happens once he has had that late tyre change. Well, let's see. That was in replay then, as you can see, as uh, Nico Muller and Jamie Green went past Renny Rast. And uh, there, Ernst Moser on the uh, pit wall. Now, as I say, it was altogether easier for Nico Muller and Jamie Green to go by Renny Rast than it was for uh, Joel Eriksson. But you can see he's, he's losing lumps and lumps and lumps of time. So back onto the loud pedal for Rennie Rast, who we are on board with right now, who's running in that P6 place. Here's our race leader, Marco Wittmann, uh, being chased down by Joel Eriksson and uh, Philip Eng. It's Philip Eng that's running P2, Joel Eriksson is P3, then it's Nico Muller and Jamie Green. There is Rast then, who all of a sudden is going to have Jonathan Aberdeen for company as well. Jonathan Aberdeen stopping on uh, lap 13. Surely, 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 no, uh, Rast stays out. Because uh, René Rast is lapping uh, significantly slower than leader Wittmann at the moment. Uh, and they've got to be seeing those lap times, so there's a strategy they've got in there somewhere uh, which they believe is going to come in to play later on in this race. Robin Fryne sets the fastest lap then. So uh, Robin Fiennes, of course, who was hampered, if you like, by that uh, time penalty, well, he... He's not necessarily observing the uh, uh, high curbs uh, keep off rule. <laughs> not that it is a rule, but it's uh, the advice that uh, has been given by various team members. And you can see there Jonathan Aberdeen perhaps under investigation. So while all this is going on, Marco Wittmann, who is still lapping in the 125.6s, uh, Ericsson is quicker by five tenths. Uh, and uh, looking elsewhere on the timing screen, also quicker is uh, Nico Muller. So um, I'm impressed with how quick Wittmann's lap times are when you consider he is on old tyres. Super smooth, though, isn't he? Yeah, I mean, he's, smooth driver. he's got a, a, a similar pace or a better pace than those that have just recently pitted. Black and white flag being showed to Jonathan Aberdeen for forcing another car uh, off the track. A black and white flag is only a warning. Uh, but it does mean that you're being watched by the steward, so best no more misdemeanors, that's for sure. Marco Wittmann has dived into the pit lane. Pit stop line, pit stop line. Stay on the brake during the stop. Change your brake balance to the rear. When you come out, you will have, you will come in between Glock and Fritz, so Fritz will come for the rear, and you will get a used set of tires. Also in is Rene Rast. So Marco Wittmann in then, and the RMG team go to work on the Marco Wittmann car. A 5.9 second stop. Watch the right line. Here's Renny Rast, who is, of course, yet to stop into his pit box. So need a good uh, stop also from the Audi Sport team, Rosberg. I think it was 5.9, wasn't it? This is not going to be uh, troubling that time, is it? Oh, no. Oh, that was an awful stop. Aberdeen and Duval are going to have to change position. We saw that. Do you remember from that heli shot where yeah. those two was, were, they, were together? Clattered. Yeah, yeah. Well, in fairness, um, there he is, uh, Mike Rockefeller. Looks like Lloyd Duval has already uh, picked up that uh, change of position. And uh, here we can see it in replay then. And uh, from the uh, splitter cam on the Mike Rockefeller car, that was the contact. Bad. You picked that up. I didn't. I didn't see that. Significant damage to the yes. front of the uh, Jonathan Aberdeen car. Uh, he, of course, running for the independent WRT team, the customer team of Audi, along with uh, Pietro Fittipaldi. And I would wonder whether he might actually get called in for that as being an unsafe car. Well, he's not even been shown the uh, orange and white, uh, orange and black flag yet, has he? So I. Hope not. Yeah. Hmm. OK, our race leader is Philip Eng, then, who's got 1.6 seconds over um, Joel Eriksson. There he is in P2. Nico Muller is P3. Now, Rast and uh, Wittmann have been in now. Um, oh, just as we <laughs> mentioned it, Jonathan Aberdeen does get the black flag with orange disc then to warn of uh, that mechanical issue. It's not so much a mechanical issue, but the bodywork uh, flapping there that you could see. 
So, of those, the best placed uh, driver that's made two stops, running in P7, Mike Rockefeller. So, it's a question of durability now, isn't it? So, we've got 13 minutes plus three laps of the race remaining. There is Jamie Green running in uh, P4. And uh, car number 47, Joel Eriksson in uh, P2 with the uh, Audi car of Nico Muller chasing him and Jamie Green trying to get onto the back of that pack as well. Uh, for the moment, Philip Eng has got a very comfortable margin of some 2.2 seconds. So they're the uh, number 27 car of Jonathan Aberdeen into the pit lane and regret to say that... Front button, bonnet. Uh, so you are going to be pushed inside and to have the car repaired. Um, now... OK. Is the ring over or are we going out again? I wonder, you know, whether they're going to apply we... the gaffer tape in the garage. <laughs> and they're going to think about sending him back out again because it would be valuable data that they could uh, that they can provide to WRT for getting the car back out again if they can, if they so decide. Yeah, but, it's, but... it's very, very important just to get that running in. They haven't had loads of testing either, have they? So it's important to, well, get, to get the running in. They are... Um, they are going to apply the gaffer tape in the garage rather than in the pit lane, which uh, lends itself to me thinking that probably we won't see the uh, Jonathan Abdeen car back out again, but I might be wrong. This is uh, Rennie Rast then. Could you see something on the top speed? With a fault. Yes, it's dropping. Oh, Take so. the data sti stick, we retire. That's a great shame. Yes. A great shame. It breaks as much as possible. I noticed his lap times were quite a lot lower after his pit stop. Um, right. Marco Wittmann, on the other hand, uh, who had uh, new tyres, uh, is lapping fairly quickly. Yeah, he's lapping in the 24 fives, isn't he? Mm. Uh, the only other one rap lapping in the uh, similar time, 124 five six, is uh, Robin Fries. Everyone else in the 25s or 26s. So that's a great shame to see the uh, Rennie Rast car retired. So he is out of the race. And, well. Expecting a good fight back to come from uh, Rennie Rast in uh, the uh, later stages of the uh, race, but that wasn't to be. This is our race leader and leading with a margin of some three seconds, Philip Eng. He's got ten and a half minutes plus three laps. There's P2 and there is P3. So Joel Eriksson and Nico Muller. Joel Eriksson and Philip Eng, of course, making their DTM debuts in the same year. Uh, Joel Eriksson uh, taking a win at Mizano last year. Philip Eng still yet to take his uh, maiden DTM win. And is he on course to do that with uh, 10 and a quarter minutes plus three laps remaining? Very, very good driver is Philip Eng. He seems to have found something that no one else has got because he has made such good progress at the grid. And now that he's in P1, he's holding an excellent gap. And uh, he has really got a grip with this Zolder circuit. And his lap times are supreme. 125.918 last time around. Compare that to a 126.2s for Joel Eriksson and Nico Muller. That's why his margin is increasing. It's up to 3.3 seconds now. Uh, what, of course, he does have to consider is by pushing as hard as he is, although he's able to be super smooth because he's not troubled by anyone, he's not having to fight anything, what he's got to do is uh, maintain the durability of those tyres to get him to the end of the race as well, uh, because we know there are a number of drivers that are going to come on strong, perhaps right towards the end of the race. And I'm thinking of the likes of uh, Mike Rockefeller and potentially Paul DeResta and Ferdinand Habsburg as well. Those are the uh, three drivers that have made two stops. And uh, having said that, a 3.3 second lead is a lovely cushion to have, isn't it? Of course it is, and he's still got six push to pass remaining and six laps worth of DRS remaining as well. And you can see those orders on the left-hand side of your screen. Nico Muller has uh, still got plenty as well when he takes the fight to uh, uh, Joel Eriksson ahead of him, as he doubtless will in the uh, remaining eight and a half minutes plus three laps of this race. And yeah, you can see Nico Muller is now taking that fight to Joel Eriksson. So got a bit of a fight on our hands for P2 now, haven't we? Between the BMW driver and uh, the Audi driver, Nico Muller. The BMW driver is Joel Eriksson. And uh, the Audi driver is one Mr. Nico Muller. And uh, behind those two is uh, Jamie Green, who's also uh, fighting everything he can to try and get on terms with that little battle as well. And the more Joel Eriksson and uh, 
Nico Muller will fight. So too, that will allow Jamie Green to get ever closer. And so uh, there you can see as this fight continues over this uh, P2 place, we saw a retirement for uh, the number 76 car of Jake Dennis. Let's hear from him. So very unfortunate for Jake Dennis. You had to retire the race. Do you have any idea what the issue is? Why did you have to retire? No, we're still obviously investigating. The car's not back at the moment. And for me, all the power just shut down. So we have no idea what the issue is. It's a bit unfortunate because well, uh, my, my teammate also had an issue, which caused the safety car which is perfect timing for me. And as I entered the pits, we had the issues. Uh, really frustrating, because it looked like we would have benefited ma massively from this. Obviously, a bit of luck, but then obviously, bad luck struck when we broke down. So, yeah, I have no idea what the issue is, but uh, we analyze tonight and start again tomorrow. Hopefully, you'll get it fixed by tomorrow. Thank you so much, Jake. Back to you. So, as we were talking about uh, Jake Dennis, I know you were pontificating uh, with regards to uh, Paul Duresta, who uh, currently is running in P7 and teammate, of course, to Jake Dennis. What are your thoughts, Brian? Well, Paul Duresta uh, adopted a different uh, uh, tyre strategy to most, and uh, if you remember, he came in just before the safety car uh, went back into the pits, and uh, he started right at the back, so worked his way to uh, P7, is excellent progress and uh, Aston Martin must be uh, smiling. Well, of course they need to because having uh, lost to both Jake Dennis and Danny Yucadea, they want some brightness and uh, indeed they've got that with the uh, likes of uh, Paul Resta and Ferdinand Habsburg who are running P7 and P8 at the moment. Lap times between Joel Eriksson and Nico Muller as you can see. And of course we've also seen the retirement of the number 33 car of Rennie Rast and Verena's got him right now. How very unfortunate, René. Last race, you ended on a high, and now you ha this is happening in Zolda. What was the issue? What happened? Uh, in the end, I lost uh, engine power. Uh, we have to analyze what it is exactly, but I felt that uh, yeah, there was no power left, so we decided to stop before we uh, put uh, the oil completely on track, uh, the track completely on oil. Uh, yeah, but till the safety car was uh, running smoothly, P3, and then the safety car came out, but then the race basically was over, unfortunately. Yeah, but sometimes it's like that. Right, well, best of luck. They'll fix it for tomorrow. Thank you and back to you. Well, um, Renny Rast will, of course, uh, come back from that. Bear in mind, in Hockenheim, race one, he finished P16. Went on to win the second race. Who knows what will happen tomorrow. Now, Mike Rockefeller is another one of those that started right at the very back of the pack. And look at this. He's running in P6. So, you know, both strategy, overtakes, safety car, all of those things are thrown into the melting pot means it, all of a sudden it's very, very difficult to predict who's going to be where uh, come the end of a DTM race. We've got three laps plus uh, five minutes remaining and Philip Eng is leading by some 3.1 seconds over this man, Joel Eriksson, who's P2. And then it is uh, Nico Muller. Now, in the last lap, Joel Eriksson was a few tenths quicker, three tenths quicker, than uh, Philip Eng. So is the fight back coming from uh, Joel Eriksson now? As we reach the final stages of the race, uh, DRS and push to pass becomes unrestricted now. So there is uh, Joel Eriksson, there is Nico Muller. What would really play into the hands of Philip Eng here is for Nico Muller to get right on the back of Joel Eriksson so that all of a sudden Joel Eriksson's too busy dealing with defending from Nico Muller that he's not able to encroach on that comfortable margin of just over three seconds that Philip Eng has built into the lead of the race. And uh, being at the front, Philip Eng has also got those six DRS uses and the six push to passes, which he can keep in his back pocket so that if, uh, if Eriksson does close up on him, he can put up a fight. That's a very, very good point. Of course, he would need Ericsson to get by him uh, to enable that, but uh, he'll be hoping, of course, that he can keep his nose in front yeah. in any event. And uh, at the moment, I think, sure enough, as I perhaps predicted, that Nico Muller is taking this fight to Joel Ericsson now, which is um, allowing... Oh, and a very, very sad uh, Rennie Rast walks away. Uh, such a professional, though, he knows that he will come back fighting tomorrow. Uh, just as I say that uh, Joel Eriksson and uh, Nico Muller are fighting hard, actually, Joel Eriksson has taken some time out of Philip Eng. Uh, the gap back now is just 2.8 seconds. So, and there you can see, there's proof of it on the screen, lap 33, 32 and 31, the uh, margin between uh, Joel Eriksson and Nico Muller. So, Joel Eriksson is being unhindered at the moment by defending from Nico Muller. And that is not playing into the hands of Philip Eng, truthfully. All Philip Eng can do is concentrate on uh, nailing every apex and doing everything perfectly, which he is indeed doing. 
But last lap around, it was a 127.0 for Philip Eng. It was a 126.6 for Joel Eriksson. Race leader just goes through on shot. Here's P2 and P3. Joel Eriksson just looking a little raggy coming out of that turn. That allowed Nico Muller to get a little bit closer. So Joel Eriksson in the uh, number 47 car. Of course, already a uh, DTM race winner. And now Nico Muller is virtually welded to the rear of the Joel Eriksson car. So, uh, stand by. Are we going to get a change of place for P2 now? DRS in use by Nico Muller as he very nearly touches the back end of the Joel Eriksson car. This fight for P2. Joel Eriksson does his level best to defend. He makes the car as wide as possible to deny Nico Muller the opportunity to come through into turn number one. Took a look at the inside, but Nico bailed out of it uh, to protect both the cars because he knows if it had dived to the inside that there would have been a clatter between the two of them and potentially a race ending uh, clatter between the two of them. So uh, good driving from Nico Muller. You know, sometimes in your quest to move up a further place, sometimes you have to be the bigger man, don't you? And think, do you know what? This is just too risky. And you compute all that information in milliseconds. Yeah. And uh, Joel Eriksson's tyres, I don't think, are in as good a state as they might be because uh, we've seen him a little bit tail happy as he was defending. Indeed. Indeed. And I felt he was beginning to look a bit ragged. And proof of that is in his last lap, lap time, a 127.4. Uh, Philip Eng was a clear one second quicker than that. And Nico Muller, who's chasing Joel Eriksson, was uh, four tenths quicker than that. So I think you're absolutely right. I think Nico Muller has probably, probably. Uh, got the edge here. This is uh, Paul DeResta, who's running in P7. Mike Rockefeller, who started plum last, is running in P6. We have just under a minute and a half, plus three minutes remaining in this uh, DTM race one of two here at Zolder. So, Nico Muller, is it a question of when, not if, that he tries to make this move on Joel Eriksson? He's not as close to him across the... Uh, timing line on this occasion as he was last time around. Has he spotted somewhere else on this track where he feels that he can make a move? Well, only time will tell as this uh, plays out. What Joel Eriksson can ill afford to do now is make even the tiniest of mistakes because Nico Muller, like a viper, is ready to pounce as he reels in that BMW of Joel Eriksson. They make their way down behind the paddock here at Zolder. We're live from Belgium with TTM. And we are watching the battle that is going on for P2 at the moment. Up the road by 4.3 seconds is Philip Eng, who is leading the race. So, under braking there. Nico Muller gets a little bit closer. This fantastic heli shot that reveals this uh, fight that's going on for P2 at the moment. Around this really uh, extraordinary solder circuit, which is set in really rather picturesque surroundings. Lots of trees, lots of greenery. There's our race leader just disappearing on the right-hand side of your screen. In the meantime, uh, Joel Eriksson uh, continuing to uh, try and defend from Nico Muller. I believe Nico Muller now is just easing off a bit for a a real effort towards the end of this race because as they cross the timing line now they will have three more laps to run and philip eng must be smiling to himself because really in reality all he needs to do is keep it on the gray stuff and bring it home because uh, these two are not going to reel him in in uh, three laps certainly not because eng's last lap was a 126.7 these two are in the 27s so Joel Eriksson for the moment has got the measure of Nico Muller, but with three laps left to go, I don't think Nico Muller is done with this yet. Nico Muller has got six uh, push to passes remaining. He's got three laps worth of DRS remaining. Joel Eriksson is reduced to one DRS lap remaining and two pushes to pass. Nico Muller then uses the DRS to uh, propel himself ever closer to uh, Joel Eriksson. This fraught fight for P2 that continues. We're on to the uh, third lap of three left to run in this DTM race one here at Zolder. Where can Nico Muller try and provoke a mistake from Joel Eriksson to try and propel himself up to P2? Philip Eng up the road, potentially undaunted now by these two because they are slowing as they're fighting between each other. That is playing into the hands of Philip Eng, who's rubbing his hands with invisible soap and just focusing on what he needs to do and getting up the road. 
there, so. are, there are no points awarded for having uh, DRS or push to pass left at the end of the race, are there? So, no, no, um, Nico Muller um, has nothing to lose but to give it, it all now because in these last two laps, he can just throw everything he's got at Joel Eriksson, which we can see him doing. So, Joel Eriksson then, I have to say, under the immense pressure that he's uh, got from Nico Muller, he ain't making mistakes. <laughs> And Joel Eriksson doing a very good job here. New into DTM last year, of course, for Joel Eriksson. Took that win in a really rather weather-affected race at Misano in Italy. He was utterly speechless. You can't say that often about Joel, uh, <laughs> who is one of the uh, real, real talents in uh, DTM. And the uh, DTM field is littered with talents, of course. First uh, met Joel when he was uh, racing in uh, Formula 3. and. The talent as Mike Rockefeller just goes past Jamie Green there like a hot knife through butter to pick up P5. Bear in mind, Mike Rockefeller started plum last in this race. And Mike Rockefeller on a real charge now. How far is he down on Loic Duval? Mm, five seconds. Right. I was saying about Joel Erickson, uh, he was a star in uh, Formula 3 and a star in DTM as well, and he's in P2 at the moment with uh, Nico Muller still pushing him. Now, as they cross the timing line this time around, we will be into the last lap. It's now or never for Nico Muller to try and wrestle this P2 away as both of them use DRS, one to defend and one to attack. Nico Muller not able to get to the inside there of uh, Joel Eriksson. It's this risk-reward calculation that's got to be made now. Does Nico Muller bank P3? Or does he throw everything, including caution, to the wind to try and find a way past Joel Eriksson for P2? We have the remainder of this lap to see if that happens. They have driven so well, the both of them. Great defending from Joel Eriksson, great attacking from uh, Nico Muller. Oh, and Eriksson does make a mistake, but Nico was just not in a position to be able to take advantage of that. Oh, he actually jumped up and down he in did. the comms booth. It's <laughs> extraordinary, this fight between the two of them. That was a big save from Joel, to be fair, and Nico was just wrong-footed. He wasn't quite in the right place. He was airborne, wasn't he? He was airborne, <laughs> so was I. Um, <laughs> talking about quite a weight there. Um, so Joel Eriksson, P2. But this is going to be his first DTM win if he's able to cross the line in P1. And Philip Eng has one more chicane to do. The young Austrian, a super guy, heads towards the checkered flag. <laughs> Philip Eng wins. I am absolutely right. thrilled for it. And here comes Joel Eriksson and Nico Muller. And how lucky was Joel Eriksson not to pick up any damage when he went airborne over those curbs? Extraordinary. Apologies if Philip Eng was uh, lively with his language on the team radio. I was talking over it. He is a DTM race winner. Philip Eng takes the win from Joel Eriksson. <laughs> Nico Muller. Thank you, guys. Thank you. We came back from nowhere again. Really proud of you. Look at Thanks this, a lot. Lloyd Duval, P4, uh, Mike Rockefeller, P5, wow. Jamie Green, P6, Marco Wittmann led the race, P7. Then it's Paul DeResta, P8, Ferdinand Check Habsburg, P9, Check picking up his first points in DTM, and uh, P10 for Bruno Spengler. Lucky, we had the pace, but missed the luck. So drive offline, maximize the pickup, save fuel. I have to say, I think driver of the race is actually Mike Rockenfeller. He demonstrated how to uh, save tyres and use strategy wisely. Wow. Well done, Philip. I have followed. RPM on two at the home race. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you very much. I'm really happy to be with you. Thank you. Oh. I've talked about Philip in a lot of his racing career. And he's, he's one of life's good guys. He really is. And I am absolutely thrilled that he's taken that DTM win. Thrilled, thrilled, thrilled. It threatened last year, but it didn't quite happen. And mm. He's done it in the second round of uh, 2019. I'm the man. I'm the man. I'm so happy. 
Ah, das ist ein unglaublich einfach geiles Gefühl. Ich bin so froh, dass ich hier bin und so froh, bei BMW zu sein. I wish. Wir hatten ein bisschen Glück mit dem Safety Car. Happy to be here, happy to be with the team and of course happy to take this fantastic win. I think we can get that, Phil. <laughs> you get the feeling this won't be his last win either. Oh, don't absolutely you? It's the not. first of no. many, probably. Great mature drive from him. Uh, he is a supreme driver, and I have to say, um, uh, so deserved. From seventh on the grid as well. Whoever said you uh, can't overtake in Zolder? And do you know what? You know, I stand here and I talk about this this race action as it unfolds and. Uh, the great thing about DTM is you look at it and actually throughout the pack, mm. you know, you, you, clearly you know who's P1 from qualifying, who's yeah. starting on pole position. Yeah. Does that tell you who's going to win the race? No, it j jolly well doesn't. It really didn't today, did it? <laughs> you know, you have so many things that can be thrown into the mix now. You know, safety cars, uh, strategy, all sorts of things. It's brilliant. And well done, Philip Eng. Winning from uh, Joel Erickson, uh, Nico Monod. <laughs> To say defend of the day going to Joel Erickson, you wait till I see him later. Uh, <laughs> he learned that you see, I helped him in terms of his defense there. I mean, you, you may recall, I think it was Thursday or Friday when he handbraked his push bike and yes. just stop and talk to me. Yes, uh, <laughs> so here they all come then. And brilliant news for Ferdinand Habsburg, who of course uh, gets points uh, mm. for finishing uh, P9, and Paul de Resta, a very creditable P8 as well. So you know, it's all good news, isn't it, uh, Sir Philip Eng? He's going to be one very happy bunny when he jumps out of that uh, number 25 car, I can assure you of that. And it'll be a delight for Verena to catch up with him at some point as well, I know. Uh, look, I think he's got tears in his eyes. And Not surprised. He is a very emotional guy. I remember in, uh, in uh, Porsche racing with uh, Philip Eng many, many years ago. My goodness, he's so, you know, he is emotional, but he's a great good. driver as well, and I'm delighted Isn't for him. Isn't that great, though? What's what we want to see? Emotion and passion. This should be good. <laughs> oh, well done, Philip. <laughs> he has done it. Come on, on the roof. And on the roof. Can I just say, <laughs> by a margin of 8.6 seconds. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. And um, the, fir the starters of the first two row. That all in DTM four of them, is like another month. But all four of the first four on the grid were nowhere in the grand scale of things, which shows how competitive this DTM field is. Extraordinary. Absolutely extraordinary. I just so wish in this comms booth we had a camera and you'd have seen me jump. <laughs> I felt I it. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't it, believe it. It registered on the Richter scale, I think, didn't it? There was no need for that. <laughs> now you're being personal. <laughs> <laughs> Let's celebrate with our race winner, Philip Eng, then. Yes. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Absolutely done a supreme job and has nailed it here at Zolder. Philip Eng, race winner from Joel Eriksson, P2. Nico Muller takes P3, ahead of Loic Duval, P4. Mike Rockefeller, Jamie Green, P5, P6. Then it was Marco Wittmann. Then Paul de Resta, Ferdinand Habsburg, ahead of Bruno Spengler, Sheldon van der Linde, Robin Freins, Timo Glock, Pietro Fittipaldi, and regrettably we saw retirements from the likes of Jonathan Aberdeen, Rennie Rast, Danny Junkadea, and Jake Dennis. He doesn't even take this crash helmet off yet. <laughs> so, Philip Eng celebrating with the uh, team then, who always have confidence in him. And that, of course, confidence is returned by... He's had a load of creditable results. And here's the driver standings then after three of 18 races. And this, Marco Wittmann, 43 points. Philip Eng is P2 in the uh, points. Uh, then it's Nico Muller and Robin Fryens and Mike Rockefeller and of course uh, 3 2 one points awarded for one two three in terms of qualifying as well and every single point matters when it comes to the end of the season and Philip Eng P2 in the points and race winner here and let's see his car, car cross the timing line once again the checkered flag unfold and fell upon the roof of uh, Philip Eng race winner at Zolder That's a great shot. And there, Bart Manpei, you can see there. Of course, local for the team as well, which is, you know, it gives the team such a boost. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Love these images. 
And there, all three. Philip Heng in the middle, Joel Eriksson to the left, and Nico Muller to the right-hand side. And Joel Eriksson, oh, that was a big save, friend. <laughs> did so well to hold on to that. Uh, brilliant. Oh, and congratulations from uh, Bruno Spengler as well. That's nice to see. Great camaraderie, isn't there, within the uh, manufacturers, of course, and across all the DTM drivers as well. I cannot tell you how thrilled I am for him. Joel Eriksson, though, what a great job to take P2. He's with Verena. Oh, wow. What a phenomenal job, Joel. I mean, from eight coming to two, and you were defending so brilliantly. You did one tiny little mistake. We were all hold, holding our breath, but then second place. You've got to be really, really thrilled. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's quite unbelievable, but I mean, I was I was pushing maximum through the whole stint. I know, I know we were going for the, for the undercut, and then, I mean, it's up to me during the race, so uh, yeah, I maximized it, and then um, yeah, I saw Nico was chasing me, and then yeah, I tried to to not do any mistakes, but then in the last lap it was impossible because my tires were were too old. So as soon as I touched the brake, I just I just locked the tires and went a bit wide. But I mean, it was a good fight with Nico. He really put me on pressure. So uh, super happy for for my friend Philip to take his maiden win. So I um, yeah, really enjoyable. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Joel. And back to you. Thank you very much. And it was a brilliant fight between Nico Muller and uh, Joel Eriksson for that uh, P2 place. And Joel credited Nico Muller there for pushing him very, very hard. But uh, in the end, his tire tag did make him make a mistake, but he was able to save it from there. And I still think Nico will be uh, furious that he wasn't able to quite take advantage of that. Wasn't quite close enough at that particular point. But uh, there we have it. That's motor racing. And... Uh, that's why we love it. Philip Eng, P1, Joel Eriksson, P2, Nico Muller, P3, and the podium awaits. And there you can see the uh, dignitaries standing by for the uh, trophy presentations then to be made. Philip Eng, race winner at last, Verena. Finally, at last, your maiden victory. Congratulations. And considering you came from P7, I mean, just tell me, how does it feel? I'm the luckiest and happiest guy on earth right now. Uh, I can't describe. This is a very special feeling. I was dreaming, uh, dreaming of this many, many times in difficult nights when things didn't go to plan. But uh, I'm just the happiest guy alive. Uh, I have to thank BMW and my team for a perfect strategy. Uh, we were lucky with the safety car, of course, but in racing there, all, there is always a factor of luck. And um, I just executed uh, well, so here I am. Uh, it's the best feeling in the world. And you did so well. Thank you so much. Enjoy the moment up there. And now back to the commentator. Well, thank you so much. And uh, Philip there, uh, as, uh, as is expected of him, actually, uh, paying due credit to the team. And also, he's very self-deprecating, you know, saying that, you know, luck played a part and, you know, all I could do was execute what I could execute. But uh, today the cards ran in my favour. And uh, you make your own luck as well, don't you? Hey? <laughs> such a grounded guy, you know, and, um, you know, so deserving of that uh, first DTM win. Well, that team are going to be very happy and they're going to be uh, sharing in the uh, celebrations and a slug or two, I would suggest, of the, uh, of the carbon uh, when it is uh, uncorked on the podium as Philip Eng makes his way there now. This uh, extraordinary uh, Zolder circuit. There's Nico Muller to the right-hand side of your picture. And the congratulations continuing as the uh, drivers make their way towards the uh, podium here at uh, Zolder. Congratulations all round then. You win and lose as a team, and we say it so often, don't we? But uh, all those engineers that work many, many hours um, to give the drivers we have to say the best they can. That's the 83rd victory of BMW. Here where all the DTM history began, where in 1984 the first BMW victory was done. And made by Harald Groß, who is driving the Touring Cup Classics. At this weekend. So there is uh, Joel Eriksson just listening in to Oli Settler there uh, in terms of some of the facts here of uh, DTM at Zolder and also BMW here at uh, Zolder. And here he is, the first victory in his career. Congratulations to today's winner of race three. Congratulations, Philip Eng. Here is Philip Eng then about to take to the top step of the podium. It won't be the only time. 
Here comes uh, Joel Eriksson then to take B2. Uh, we got Wenga missing. Clap your hands for place three for Nico Muller, the Swiss guy. So, Philip Eng, Joel Eriksson, and here comes Nico Muller. Chris Nissan there to uh, make trophy presentations along with uh, David Coulthard. And Bert Mumpai then. Team boss, local team to uh, Zolder here. <laughs> Congratulations to all four of you. And now we get the national anthem of Austria for our winner, Philip Eng. Congratulations. plays out then for Philip Eng. Just mentioned he finished 8.6 seconds ahead of uh, with a winning driver out of the hands that uh, Ericsson really did run out of tyres at the end, didn't he? Yeah. Mm. So David Coulthard then makes the trophy presentation to Philip Eng. Well done, Philip. the trophy for Bart Mumpai, the head of BMW So Chris Team Nissan, RPM. then a former DTM driver the and guy, congratulations. held uh, various management positions and in motorsport and makes the trophy Chris presentation to Bert Mumpai. Eric Van der Poel then, the 1987 DTM champion, making the trophy presentation to uh, uh, Joel Eriksson for P2. And uh, Nico Muller then in receipt Nico of his trophy for P3. Well done, Nico. So the carbon then awaits unleash. However, photos must be taken first with trophies. Not quite yet, Chris. You can stay on the podium. First, we have the photos. Um, yes, Chris, that, Eric, and David uh, will, ready to make haste their escape uh, very from, wise. <laughs> from the uh, podium. And as I see, when the photographers are finished and ready, Ollie Settler, then the uh, say, man that's guys, charged with the uh, podium presentations. Let the champagne spray. So here comes the carbon champagne, then. And oh, Philip, you lost out because <laughs> Nico was ahead of you. <laughs> Oh, a great open from Joel Eriksson. <laughs> Love the celebrations. <laughs> Some poor unsuspecting engineer is going to get covered. Love it. Supreme celebrations. A race full of stories, truthfully. That was uh, DTM uh, race one from Zolder. And of course, we look at the result today. Does that tell us who's going to be a uh, race winner tomorrow? Of course it doesn't. And that's why we love the DTM.
What an amazing race here in Zelda, and we just saw a fun uh, champagne party up there, and that was the maiden win of Philip Eng, so that was pretty exciting. And we're looking forward to the race tomorrow. You don't want to miss it, so here are the highlights of today. Enjoy. See you tomorrow. Bye-bye.